As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see. My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the upper room in Jerusalem where Jesus served communion to his apostles. But as you study the New Testament, you find believers then regularly begin to partake of communion. Why? Was this just a religious formality? I don't think so. Jesus was not really a religious kind of guy. Everything that Jesus did had significance and meaning. So what was the significance of that bread? What was the significance of that cup? Was this just a new religious ritual or was Jesus really communicating something to them and to us? What he was communicating was so important that it became a tradition in the church that we still practice today. Why communion? Why do believers all over the world love communion so much? What is the reason for communion? Why do you need to practice it? That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and Denise is with me again today. Denise, thanks for being with me. Rick, thanks for inviting me. You know I'm excited about this communion subject. You know, on Friday of this week, we're going to be receiving communion, me and you, mm -hmm. and our TV family together. That's why we have the bread, and we have the cup here because on Friday we're going to receive communion. So we want you to prepare your bread and your juice and we're going to receive communion together. But we need to know what is communion. Why do we partake of communion? Everyone does it. Every church does it. Jesus commanded us to do it. Why did he command us to partake of communion? We need to know why we do this. It's more than grape juice and crackers. It really has meaning and we need to know what is the meaning of communion. And that's why we're teaching this series called Insights on Communion. And we want you to order the series. It's five parts. It is just jam-packed with teaching, revelation, information. In the last program, we saw the nine components that are required in every covenant. Today, we're going to pick up there again, and we're going to build on top of it. But all of that is in this series. It comes in f different formats. And it comes with a great study guide. Denise, I just love these study guides. I love them too, Rick. I mean, they're like works of art. They're so magnificent. They're really like books. They just contain gems, such in-depth, profound studies, and it will reinforce everything you see or you hear in the series that you order. So order your study guide and your series today. And this week we're offering you Denise's tremendous little book called Redeemed from Shame. It may look small, but my friends, this is a powerful book. And if you deal with any issues of shame, or maybe you have a child or a spouse or a friend that does, this book will set them free. We want you to order your copy today. But today, we're going to return to our subject about communion. What is the significance of communion for you and for me? Now, yesterday, we saw the nine components of a covenant. That is very foundational to understand communion. And today we're going to go back to those nine components and see how every one of them has application for us who know Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I hope you have your Bible because today we're going to cover a lot of material. Denise, do you have your Bible? I've got my Bible. All right, I've got my notes. And let's very quickly go over the nine components of a covenant. In most ancient covenants, there were first covenant promises, second, a bloody sacrifice, three, a bloody path, number four, blessings and curses, number five, a mingling of blood, number six, a change of names, number seven, an exchange of gifts, number eight, a covenant meal, and finally, number nine, there was a memorial event. All of these elements of a covenant took place in Jesus' covenant that he made with you and with me, and I'm going to show you that today in the Bible. Let's begin with number one, covenant promises. As I told you yesterday, when covenants were made, people primarily entered into a covenant for four reasons. Number one, they wanted a relationship. Number two, protection. 
then trust, then love. These things were guaranteed. You could depend on them if you entered into a covenant. And in every covenant, there was an exchange of promises. That's why promises are made when people get married and they have a marriage vow. All of that is based on the ancient tradition of making a covenant. That's where that comes from. Well, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, because we are in covenant with Jesus, listen to this verse, according to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Jesus made a covenant promise with us that he would give us everything we need for life and for godliness. That is so powerful. And when the Bible says hath given, the Greek word really means to bequeath, to amply provide, to generously donate, to fully supply. He has bequeathed to us everything. By the way, in Greek, this is the word panda. It is all things. It is all inclusive, nothing excluded. He has literally given us everything that pertains to life and Godliness. The word life is the Greek word zoe, which in this case refers to natural life. The word godliness, the Greek word eusebia, which refers to spiritual life and eternal things. God has given us everything we need, both for life and for godliness. You see, some people think God's given us everything we need for eternity, but he's also given us everything we need for life. There are covenant promises that were made to us. We were given the blood of Jesus, the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. We were given salvation, which includes soundness of mind, healing, preservation, deliverance. All of that is for life. But we were also given promises of godliness, the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to walk with God, the promise of heaven. We were given promises for life, and godliness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then look at verse 4. Whereby are given unto us. That word given again is the Greek word which means to bequeath, to amply give, to generously donate, to fully supply. We were fully supplied with exceeding great and precious promises. Exceeding great is the Greek word which means magnificent, stunning, impressive, Precious promises. The word (laughs) precious describes something of great worth. The word promises is really the Greek word for a pronouncement. You see, God made a vow. He made a pronouncement to us when he entered into covenant with us. And the pronouncements, the promises that he made, they are precious. They are stunning. They are impressive. In fact, the Bible says that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. As I told you yesterday, when you received somebody else's blood, It was like a blood transfusion took place and you literally became a partaker of that other person's life. We became partakers of the divine nature. And actually the word partakers here, listen to this, is from the Greek word koinonia, which is from the word koinos, which refers to things that are common or mutually shared, such as property that jointly belongs to two or more people. The idea of commonality or connectedness is intrinsic to the meaning of this word. When koinos is developed into the word koinonas, it conveys the idea of engagement, involvement, fellowship, participation. So when the Bible says that we might be partakers of the divine nature, it means we share the same nature. My friend, Jesus' blood came into us. We literally became partakers of the divine nature. And because of that, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, we have escaped the corruption that is in the world. The word escaped being the Greek word, which means to escape from, to be separated from. The word corruption is the Greek word which describes corruption, decay, perishableness, rottenness. When the life of God came into me and you, it literally separated us from all of that. We became real participants real sharers, partakers in the divine nature because the blood of Jesus came into us. But in every sac- in every covenant, there also was a blood sacrifice. Now, how does that have to do with you and me? Well, as I told you, the word covenant, I told you this yesterday, 
means to cut until the blood flows. Jesus made the covenant with his own blood. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, 24, that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant and he made the, own co the covenant with his own blood. We read in Hebrews 9, verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into the holy place, having obtained redemption for us. Jesus shed his own blood. There really was the shedding of blood, his blood, in order to obtain this covenant. Number three, a bloody path. A bloody path is part of the component of a covenant. There was a bloody path when Jesus gave his life. The bloody path was created by his own blood. He walked in his own blood as he dripped from the beating that he had received, as he carried his own cross, as he walked to Calvary. And just as in ancient covenants, there normally were witnesses who were watching. When Jesus walked that road to Calvary, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people stood on the side watching as this event took place, and they did not understand they were living witnesses of a covenant that God was cutting for you and me. But that road was covered with witnesses who were watching Jesus as he walked along that bloody path. Number four, blessings and curses are a component of every covenant. When Jesus saved us, he blessed us. He spoke his blessings on us. Ephesians chapter 1 says we're blessed with every heavenly blessing in Christ. The word blessing, the Greek word, which literally means to speak good words. God spoke good words on us when we came into Christ. Blessings have been spoken unto us because we are in the Lord. Say amen to this. Amen. Number five, the mingling of blood was a component of every covenant. As we saw yesterday in Leviticus 17, verse 11, it declares the life is in the blood. This was believed in all early cultures. It was believed in the Old Testament, believed in the New Testament. And today people really don't have a revelation of this, but the life is in the blood. And when someone gave their blood, they were literally giving their life. And if you partook of another person's blood, you literally became a co-joiner in their life. You became a participant in their life. You became flesh and blood with that other person. And as I told you yesterday, there was even a phrase called brothering. When you partook of another person's blood, you became a legal brother of that person. This is why we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus is our elder brother. He gave his blood. We have participated. We've taken his blood and we have become brothers with Jesus. We were brothered through the covenant that he made with us. That is amazing. We literally received a blood transfusion when the Spirit of God came in and the blood of Jesus came into our life. This is why we're told in Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, my friends, we became partakers of the divine nature. Again, that is what we saw in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. But that's not all. Another component in the making of a covenant was the changing of names. Listen to this. Jesus gave us his name. He gave us his name. He told us that in his name, we would lay hands on the sick and they would be healed. In his name, we would cast out devils. Or listen to this. Jesus said in John 14, verse 13, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In verse 14, Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. We have been given the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, and that name was bequeathed on us when we partook of his blood and we entered into covenant with him, the name of Jesus belongs to me. The name of Jesus belongs to you. And that is why you can confidently pray in the name of Jesus and expect results. Praise God. Hallelujah. Number seven, one component of the making of a covenant was the exchange of gifts. And as we saw yesterday in the example from 1 Samuel chapter 18, when Jonathan and David entered into covenant with each other, Jonathan bestowed some gifts on David. He gave to David his robe, he gave to David his weapons, and he gave to David his girdle. The robe represents identity and authority. So when Jonathan gave his robe to David, 
He was giving his identity to David. He was giving his authority to David. When he gave his weapons to David, he was giving his power. He was giving his protection to David. When he gave David his girdle, the girdle represented all of his wealth, all of his possessions. It meant everything that I have is at your disposal. Likewise, when Christ cut his covenant with me and you, he gave us his robe. What does that mean? Jesus gave us his identity. Wow. In 1 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He gave us his weapons. He gave us his power. We read about that in Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Or how about Philippians 4.13, where Paul says, You can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. My friends, Jesus gave you his robe. He gave you his identity. He gave you his power. He gave you his weapons. But wait, that's not all. He also gave you everything that he possesses. Jesus referred to this in John chapter 16, verse 15, when he said, All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that the Holy Spirit shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. If it belongs to Jesus, it belongs to you. You see, that is part of what was given to you. He gave you his robe, his identity. He gave you his power and his protection. He gave you all his wealth, all of his possessions. Everything that is his is at your disposal. But wait, number eight, one component in the cutting of every covenant was a covenant meal. And here we come to the issue of communion. Covenants shared bread and wine in the act of communion. And as I told you yesterday, the bread represented the person's flesh and everything that he is, everything that he has, all of his possessions, all of his material possessions, his wealth, everything. That is what the bread represented. And when you gave someone the bread in the act of communion or in the act of making a covenant, it meant I'm making a commitment to you. There is nothing I will withhold from you. Everything that I have is at your disposal. But wait, what about the wine? The wine represented a person's blood. It was the equivalent to saying, I'm not just making the promise of my possessions. I'm not just making the promise of my wealth and everything that I have is yours. I will put my blood behind it. The two of these together were powerful. A person guaranteed the promise with their own blood. That is so amazing. This symbolized the joining of life, the joining of wealth, the total joining, the two becoming one. It was the equivalent to saying, my body is your body. My blood is your blood. You and me, we have become one in every way. Jesus literally did this with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. This was not just a ritual which Jesus was giving to the disciples. My friend, Jesus was not interested in ritual. He was making a real covenant. When he gave them the bread, he was saying, everything that I have is yours. I am so committed to this. I will also give my blood to empower this promise. Wow. This was the making of a real covenant. Number nine, a memorial event. We saw this yesterday, but what does this have to do with you and with me? In the cutting of a real covenant in ancient times, there was always a witness or there was a memorial event. Something was done to signify and to remind people that a covenant had been made. It could be the planting of a tree or the heaping of stones. It could be the erecting of a column. But in our case, we have been given a witness, and the witness is called the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Bible says, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. This is a living witness that we have entered into covenant with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a witness that never leaves that continually reminds us that we are in covenant with Jesus. Or listen to Ephesians 1, verse 13. Oh, I love this verse. In whom ye also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed. Here's the witness. Here's the reminder. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of 
promise. The Holy Spirit is given as a witness to you that you are in covenant with God. Now, let me give you the RIV version of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Listen to this. You are also in him. So this applies to you as well. And not just to those who first hoped in Christ, he has also become your permanent residence, dwelling place, habitation, and home. This is what happened to you upon hearing the word of truth, the declaration of the good news, which brought you healing, wholeness, restoration, deliverance, well-being, safety, security, and protection from all the evils that had been intended for you. Look at what happens when you enter into covenant with God. Protection comes to you. He gives you his robe, his new identity. He gives you his authority. He gives you his name. He gives you his power. He gives you his protection. He gives you everything that he has. All that he has is at your disposal. All of this belongs to people who enter into covenant with Jesus Christ. And all of these things have been done for me and they've been done for you. And that is why we're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, now listen to this powerful verse, and if children, then you are heirs, and not just heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. My friend, this is not just a figure of speech. We have been brothered with Jesus. We are joint heirs. We have partaken of his blood. We've been born again. We become partakers of the divine nature. And as a result, we've been separated from the corruption that is in the world. We have literally received a divine blood transfusion, which has made us heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Every component of a covenant was performed by Jesus when he died for you and for me. There was a covenant promise. There was a blood sacrifice. There was a bloody path. There were blessings and there were curses for those who disobey. There was a mingling of blood. His blood became ours. There was a change of names. There was an exchange of gifts. There was a covenant meal and the Holy Spirit was given to us as a memorial and a witness that we are in covenant with God. All of that is what these elements mean for you and for me. Did you learn anything new today, Denise? Oh, Rick, it was fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, it's been so good, and we're just getting started because when we come back tomorrow, we're going to see a gospel-by-gospel gospel comparison of communion. We're going to go through all four gospels and see how each gospel writer recorded what took place that night when Jesus shared communion, and I think you're going to learn some new things in tomorrow's program. Wow, it's been such a pleasure to open the Word of God and share all of this with you today. I told you this would really be packed, and we're just getting started because when we come back tomorrow, we're going to continue to see what we need to understand about communion. I'll be back in just a moment, and we're going to pray for you. Many churches have communion once every quarter of the year, but what is it really all about? In Insights on Communion, Rick Renner delves into what communion meant in the ancient world and why Jesus commanded all Christians practice it. People all over the world and in every Christian denomination often take communion without really understanding what it means. In this five-part series, you'll learn what communion meant in the first century, what the symbolism of the bread and juice means, what the disciples understood when Jesus served them communion, what the spiritual and physical benefits of communion are for you today, Available in digital or physical format, starting at just $10, Insights on Communion will teach you the significance of communion and how to activate its power in your life every time you take it. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, Redeemed from Shame. If you've dealt with issues of shame, it's time for you to walk free of it forever. In this book by Denise Renner, you'll learn that Jesus took your shame on the cross and you don't need to live with it anymore. If you want to walk free from the prison of shame that you've been in for so long, the answer is waiting for you and redeemed from shame. This powerful book can be yours for just $7. Order today to discover how to have the victory that Jesus wants to give you over your past and over the shadow of shame that has tried to hover over your life. Don't miss this special offer, Insights on Communion and Redeemed from Shame. Call now or go to renner.org. Call or go online now. Friends, this is Rick Renner. Now, right now, 
I'm in the interior of the Moscow Good News Church. It is quite an amazing place. When you walk through this building, it's so beautiful and it testifies to the grace of God and the provision of God and the giving of our church and of our partners. We built this facility debt-free and because of that, the Moscow Church has never had the burden of monthly payments. All of our funds have been released to do the work of the gospel. And now we need to do that in Tulsa and I call this phase three. And I'm asking you today to pray about joining us as part of the giving team for phase three, which is paying off the Tulsa facility. And the reason we want to pay it off is because then it will release funds for us to take the teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth and dear friend, right now, the Bible is so needed. And I know that that's my heart and that is your heart. And together, we can take the Bible to the ends of the earth. So please pray about joining us for phase three to finish paying off the Tulsa building. And I want to say thank you in advance. Denise and I want to say thank you for joining us today for the program that has just flown by. It has been so jam-packed with insights about communion. We're offering you my series right now, which is called Insights on Communion. You need to hear it and hear it and hear it. It is just so full of insights on communion, which you need to understand. It comes with a marvelous study guide. We're also offering you Denise's book called Redeemed from Shame. And I want to remind you that for those who become partners, we always send a package of books as our way of saying thank you for being a partner with our ministry. When you become a partner, you help us take the teaching of the Bible to people all over the world who are really praying, God, please send somebody to me who can teach me the scriptures. That's what we do but we can't do it without the help of partners. And when you partner with us, we become a team. And together, we take the living word to people that are just starving for the word of God. And when you become a partner, that's a financial partner, we immediately send you a package of books as our way of saying, welcome to the partner family. But Denise, hasn't this been good today? Oh, Rick, this has been so fantastic. And personally, I would say I want those study guides because this is so much inside of this teaching. I'd want to meditate and meditate and meditate on this for months. Well, let's pray with our friends right now. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that today we have this privilege to sit down together and dive into the subject of covenant and be with us tomorrow, Lord, as we begin to study a side-by-side -side comparison of communion in the Gospels. Help us to see what you want us to see in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for being with us. And remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4, oh, it says where the word of a king is, mm -hmm. there's power. It is true. There's power in the word of God. Let that word work in you today, and we'll see you tomorrow. If you enjoyed this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.